All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are in unit six. All right, can you believe it? We're going to talk all about DNA, this other molecule, RNA, which we've only kind of heard of, and protein synthesis, or the making of proteins. <clears throat> so, first off, we have to look at the chemistry of heredity, right? We're going to look at the actual molecule that transfers heritable characteristics from parent to offspring, right? And that molecule, as we know, is DNA. But we didn't always know that. There was no doubt by the 1940s of the existence of chromosomes and that genes existed within these, within these chromosomes. <clears throat> but there were many questions we still didn't have answers to. For instance, we didn't actually know what genes were. We didn't know how they worked or how they operated. How did we go from a chemical, excuse me, how do we go from a chemical to a physical, ex physically expressed trait? Then, ultimately, we wanted to figure out how do genes work in general, right? How does a gene become that physical trait, okay? And ultimately, how did genes, what about a gene, determine the physical trait? So we didn't really know much. We had a general idea. Uh, and it would be over the next 80 years that we would figure out the rest. And there's still a lot left to be discovered. So we knew that genes had to be capable of at least three critical things. The first of which, genes must carry information from one generation to the next. Seems pretty simple. The second thing is genes must be able to put the information that they carry to work, to produce the phenotype, the physical traits of an organism, but we didn't know how. And thirdly, there must be a mechanism for easily copying a gene because the information must be replicated every time a cell divides, right? Remember in mitosis and meiosis, there's interphase before that happens. And in S phase of interphase, DNA is duplicated. So we knew that there had to be some kind of really, really consistent, reliable mechanism for that copying. At least we assumed there had to be because life is so prevalent on Earth. So on the screen here, you see a couple of chromosomes. These are actual chromosomes uh, taken with a type of mic microscopy, microscopy called electron microscopy. And this is just an artist's illustration. Uh, in particular, fun fact, these are actually the sex chromosomes. This is the X chromosome and this is the Y chromosome. Now, a chemical analysis of a chromosome shows that it's actually composed of half nucleic acid and half proteins, which is a little odd. It's not what we expected, and it's kind of not what we've learned up to this point, right? But I didn't want to confuse anybody because we were still kind of learning the difference between nucleic acid and protein. But it turns out that chromosomes are not just DNA, aka a nucleic acid. It turns out there are also some proteins built in. And it was originally thought, believe it or not, that the protein portion of a chromosome is what carried the genetic information. So very little was known in the early days about nucleic acids. But nucleic acids, compared to proteins, nucleic acids are very simple in their structure um, and even in their diversity. But proteins are so diverse, so different, and it can do so many different things. We just assumed that because of all the diversity that exists in the world, in life in general, that the molecule that carried these characteristics had to be equally as diverse. And that hypothesis was wrong, clearly, as we know today. And it was kind of proven wrong by these two gentlemen, James Watson and Francis Crick. It was in 1953 that these two men shook the scientific world, literally shook the scientific world by figuring out how DNA looked. What was its structure? How was it set up? Once we saw DNA's structure for the first time, that, that winding staircase-like structure that you guys see sitting on my desk all the time, it became obvious that Mendel's heritable factors, these things that he was talking about in his pea plants going from one generation to the next, and genes, which were genes, were actually composed 
of DNA of this nucleic acid. And we'll explain why the structure of DNA led to this kind of realization. But before that, let's talk about DNA, which does stand for deoxyribonucleic acid. So a DNA molecule consists of small units called, and you should know this from unit two, but my gosh, unit two at this point was four units ago. So I'll give you a break. DNA molecules consist of small, small units called nucleotides. Is it ever gonna come up? Ah, it came up over here, I'm sorry. Comprised of nucleotides should go here. In fact, several million nucleotides. And one strand of DNA consists of several million nucleotides. This structure right here on the screen, this is a nucleotide. This is what, millions of these coming together is what makes up a nucleic acid. So this is the monomer of the polymer known as a nucleic acid. And you can see there are three distinct parts to the nucleic acid, I'm sorry, the nucleotide that makes up nucleic acids. And they are the phosphate group, which is here, a five carbon sugar called deoxyribose, part of DNA's actual name, which is this green portion here, and then a part called a nitrogen base, which is gonna matter a lot later in this unit, located up here on the top right of the structure. This structure will show up on the test. This structure of a nucleotide will show up on the test. Uh, we're all over the place. We have our phosphate group, we have our deoxyribose, and we have our nitrogen base. Sorry about the formatting issues here, folks. Just a little bit of an issue between PowerPoint and slides. So basically, one nucleotide is comprised of a phosphate plus a sugar plus a nitrogen base. Simple as that. That's one nucleotide. You see how simple that is. It's not very much, right? And then you take a bunch of these nucleotides, put them all together, and you have a nucleic acid like DNA. You can understand why it would be thought that a, a molecule as simple <clears throat> as DNA could not be responsible for all the diversity that we see in the world. But we didn't know the whole story just yet. And so the sugar is a five carbon sugar, okay? So one carbon, every point is a carbon and every C is a carbon. So one, two, three, four, and five carbons. And we call that sugar deoxyribose. Now, when we talk RNA, RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, not deoxyribo. So you see, it's actually, it gets it, they get their namesake from the sugar that makes up their monomer. So this is the sugar that's in RNA, which is called ribose. And we'll talk about that later on, just a little precursor. <clears throat> All right, folks, we'll talk about nitrogen bases in the next one.